that even though I'm a guest, I actually attend here, and so I'm not an unknown guest by any means. Thanks, guys. <laughs> um, why don't you go ahead and take a second um, and just prepare your hearts before the Lord. I really feel like God has something special for each one of you, so just take a second to just enter into his presence. Um, ask God to just open up your ears, open up your hearts, open up your minds to what he's got for you. And just to take a, a second to kind of let that all sink in. Any, um, any anxious thoughts to just be able to dissipate and go so you can just really focus on what he has for you. Thank you, God. Lord, we just thank you. We just invite your presence to just continue to manifest itself here. We just invite you, God, to come and just stir the waters here, God. Do what only you can do. Speak to our hearts and change our hearts, change our minds, change our attitudes, God. Change our belief system so it aligns with the belief system of heaven. Thank you, God. God, I just pray that you would help us to be better followers in this moment. You'd, be, you'd help us to be better followers of you, better hearers of your word, better hearers of your voice. We just ask that you bless this time, God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Well, that's church, guys. Thanks for coming. No, I'm just kidding. All right. So... Today we're actually going to take a look at a, um, a passage that is probably pretty familiar. Many of you have heard it before. We've talked about it. Sometimes you've claimed it. Um, and that's John 10 in the, the Good Shepherd passage. Um, so a lot of times we've heard, like, he's our good shepherd. He knows, he knows his sheep. His sheep hear his voice. And so we kind of repeat that um, verbiage a lot in, in church setting and things like that and kind of make those declarations. So I want to take a little bit of time and actually dig into John tap, chapter 10 a little bit and uh, take a look at what's really going on because I think there's actually even more behind the scenes that sometimes we're not even aware of um, that God wants to um, speak. So I'm going to start by reading it. Then we're going to take a look at a few other passages and then come on back to John uh, 10. So it's an often quoted passage. Uh, so starting in, in uh, verse 1, it says, Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all, out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they don't recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this as a figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there, there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. The Jews who heard, this, who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said he's demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, 
These are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. How can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So at first hearing, I kind of get confused because it's like, he's just talking about sheep and shepherd. Like, why is everybody so mad? Why is everybody so upset at Jesus for talking about sheep and shepherd? What's going on here? So in order to really understand this passage and to understand the context, we actually need to go back to the Old Testament because this is imagery that Jesus is alluding to and pulling from, from chapters in, um, in the Old Testament, from, from the Hebrew scriptures. So he's speaking to Jews and he's referencing, he's alluding to Old Testament passages in this. So turn with me for a second to Isaiah 40. We're going to do some, some Bible hunting here today, okay? So I hope you guys are ready. Fingers are nimble, ready to turn some pages or hit buttons on a phone or look up at the screen, whatever you need to do. So Isaiah 40, this is a, a recurring theme in Isaiah up to this point, is that God could be trusted even in the face of her enemies. That Israel did not need to turn to other nations or to other gods for help, but God himself could be trusted to protect her. Even when Israel is living in disobedience, following after other gods, and even at the promise of invasion and exile, God would be her redeemer. God could be trusted no matter what. That God would be the ultimate victor, and Israel's enemies would not have the last word. God's trustworthiness was not even affected by Israel's obedience or disobedience. God was trustworthy regardless of what Israel did. God could be trusted in every circumstance. Even in discipline, even in the, in, in the instance in, in Isaiah, what Isaiah is talking about in terms of predicting exile, even in their disobedience, God can always be trusted to redeem and restore. So the chapter 40 begins with a cry for comforting the people of Jerusalem. He says, speak comfort, speak encouragement to the heart of Jerusalem. Declare that God is going to show up and intervene. That even if humans fall short, even though humans fall short, God will be there. God will always be there. He cries out comfort. The same, uh, same chapter, John the Baptist cries out um, in, in John, in an earlier uh, chapter of John, saying, prepare the way of the Lord. This is the same chapter in Isaiah that John is quoting from. Okay, so this is a, 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 it's obvious that Jesus is alluding to some of these imageries and passages in the John 10 chapter that we're looking at. And in one of the verses, it's basically saying, when you find yourself in a tough spot, Israel, look up because your God is coming. Look up and declare, look, it's our God. He's coming. Declare it on the mountaintops. Declare it from the hills. Our God is coming. He's coming to restore and redeem. So then when we pick up in uh, verse 10 in chapter 40, it says, See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arm and he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have young. He's a shepherd who takes care of his flock. This is God we're talking about. God says he's the shepherd who takes care of his flock. He picks up lambs and he carries them close to his heart. Now even a stronger parallel to what John is doing here is in Ezekiel. So if, turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 34. So Isaiah is prophesying at the time of, um, right, right around the time of the Assyrian uh, invasion to the north. So Israel has split kingdoms. Uh, we've got the kingdom of Israel to the north, and we've got the kingdom of Judah to the south. And um, Isaiah is prophesying in the southern kingdom about pending um, exile coming. So he's speaking not only about the Assyrian invasion that's coming to the, to the north, but he's also predicting and seeing that there's this Babylonian invasion that's going to be happening to the south as well. That happens a, a couple hundred years later. So that's Isaiah's setting. Now Ezekiel is a prophet in the exile. So he is prophesying at the same time as Daniel. They're in exile. The Babylonians have conquered the southern kingdom, have destroyed it, and carried the Israelites off to, to captivity. And so Ezekiel is prophesying at the time now of the exile. So I'm going to read a number of, a little bit longer in Ezekiel 34. So the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to you, shepherds of Israel, who only take care of yourselves. Should not the shepherds take care of the flock? 
You eat the curds, clothe yourself, clothe yourself with wool, and slaughter the choice animals. But you have not taken care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered over the mountains and on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth, and no one searched or looked for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, because my flock lacks a shepherd, and so has been plundered and has become food for all the wild animals, and because my shepherd did not search for my flock, but cared for themselves rather than for my flock. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against the shepherds and I will hold them accountable for my flock. I will remove them from tending the flock so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths and it will no longer be food for them. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so I will look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries. And I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines, and on all the settlements in the land. I will tend them in a good pasture. And the, mountains, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. They will lie down in good grazing land, and, there will be, and they will be fed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel." I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down because, declares the sovereign Lord, I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. But the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. Let's drop down to uh, verse 22. I will save my flock and they will no longer be plundered. I will judge between one sheep and another. I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will make a covenant of peace with them and rid the land of savage beasts so that they may live in the wilderness and sleep in the forests in safety. I will make them and the places surrounding my hill a blessing. I will send down showers in season, and there will be showers of a blessing. The trees will yield their fruit, and the ground will yield its crops. The people will be secure in their land. They will know that I am the Lord. When I break the bars of their yoke and rescue them from the hand of those who enslaved them, they will no longer be plundered by the nations, nor will wild animals devour them. They will live in safety and no one will make them afraid. I will provide for them a land renowned for its crops, and they will no longer be victims of famine in the land or bear the scorn of the nations. Then they will know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and that they, the Israelites, are my people, declares the sovereign Lord. You are my sheep, the sheep of my pasture. And I am your God, declares the sovereign Lord. Can anybody hear the echoes of what Jesus is saying here? After taking a look in the context, only God will be their shepherd. God has promised a pasture again. God has promised safety for the Israelites. So now when we go back to John chapter 10, speaking to a very Jewish context, speaking to a very Jewish group here, when they hear that he's the good shepherd, this is what they're thinking about. They're thinking about Ezekiel. They're thinking about the fact that God alone has said that he will be their shepherd, that he will lead them to pasture, that he will provide safety and security for them. What's Jesus saying here? In the previous chapter, Jesus healed a blind man. Um, he, kind of a weird and gross story. He spits into dirt, forms mud, puts it on the guy's eye, and says, hey, go take a walk from the temple area down to the Pool of Siloam, which is in the um, city of David, and go wash your eyes. So the guy goes, and he does that. He walks from the temple, goes to Siloam, the Pool of Siloam, washes his eyes, and he can see. The Pharisees catch wind of this story, and they call not only the man who is blind who is now can see, but they also call his parents too, right? Like, now you're really in trouble. Mom and dad have been called to the principal's office. <sighs> Woo. Okay, just prior to the healing, Jesus' disciples have a conversation about why this man was blind from birth. Was it, did he sin or did his parents sin? And Jesus tells him, neither sinned. This is just so that my glory can be made known. This is just so I can, I can 
like, have a miracle and make it happen. And Jesus heals the man on the Sabbath. So the Pharisees call this man, and they start interrogating him. They interrogate him. They interrogate his parents. It's really a funny story because the Pharisees are really the, the leaders of Israel. They can cause a lot of damage if you get on their bad side, right? So they start out. They talk to the man. Then they're not really satisfied with his answer. So they talk to his parents, and his parents are terrified. So they basically say, uh, this kid's really going to get us into trouble. You know what? He's of age. You should just talk to him. We don't have anything else to say. Like, we, I don't know what happened. We weren't there. You should just talk to him. He's, he's of age. So now the, the man has another opportunity to respond. So they, the Pharisee, Pharisees keep press, pressuring him. They want him to agree that Jesus is dangerous and that he is a sinner. That's what they, that's what they want. They want this man to acknowledge that. And this man's response is essentially... I don't really know, but all I know is I was once blind and now I can see. Like I, like, I don't know if he's a sinner or not, but like, I was blind and now I can see. Like, he healed my eyes. He opened the eyes of the blind. That's all I really know. Um, <laughs> and the Pharisees keep pressuring him. They're not happy with this answer. They keep pressuring him. They keep wanting him to acknowledge that Jesus is a sinner. And they keep asking him questions. And eventually the man says, you guys are asking a lot of questions about this event. Do you want to be his disciples too? And they get enraged. They get mad. They're like, they, they just start shouting at him. They start, he, he, this man is defending Jesus, saying that only someone who's righteous and godly could open the eyes of the blind. So I don't know if he's a sinner, but he seems to be righteous because God listens to him. And the Pharisees tell the man, so remember the, the disciples' argument at the beginning is, who is this man a sinner or was his parents a sinner? The Pharisees now, completely enraged, tell the man, you are definitely a sinner since birth. Get out of here. They kick him out, right? So Jesus finds out that the man gets thrown out from the, the Pharisees, from the community, and he goes and he finds the man, and he reveals to the man that he was the one who healed him and says, hey, do you believe now? And there are some Pharisees that were around in this interaction. And this is in John 10 then where Jesus launches into the speech against the Pharisees. So drawing from the Old, Testament, uh, the Old Testament passages in Ezekiel, especially in Ezekiel 34, Jesus proclaims that he is the good shepherd, which is the image of God in the Old Testament. And subtly, or maybe not so subtly, <laughs> accuses the Pharisees, Israel's current leaders, of being the abusive, careless, and destructive shepherds, right? So now it's like this aha moment. That's why they got so mad. Duh. Jesus is calling them out. He calls them completely out. They get so mad. They call him, a, call him demon-possessed, right? They get so mad. So Jesus is this picture of the good shepherd, Jesus is the picture of the God who knows his sheep, and they know him. This is a picture of intimacy with the Father. It's a picture of relationship. It's a picture of trust that the sheep have towards the shepherd. So shepherds were a common staple in in that culture, in that time period. Um, when we were in Israel about two years ago, we were driving on a bus. I forget where we were going, but there's like a shepherdess and her sheep with like little cane and like moving them along and everything. It was really cute. But it, it was a common staple of the culture and the land um, and the, <laughs> the surrounding areas. Um, so shepherds were known to have a familiarity with their sheep. They're actually known to be able to recognize them, to be able to identify one from another, to be able to notice like that tiny little hoof is a little bit more crooked on this one, or this one is super, super white. They're also known to even have pet names for them, um, like short pet names that the sheep would listen to, just kind of like you would call your dog. I try this with my cats, but they don't get it. But dogs, I know, do this. You can call them and they actually come to you. Actually, my cats do kind of do it, but... Um, <laughs> So there's actually like, there's like a story um, that we have like, sometimes we have inscriptions or like you find manuscripts from like old ancient days of like ancient writings, stuff like that. So there's actually like a story of like a family who had like a nickname called uh, Snowy for one of their sheep because the sheep was so white. So these little pet names for their sheep and they would call them by name. Sheep were known for their obedience and their gentleness right, that they heard, the, they heard the shepherd's voice and they would go. Goats, on the other hand, were often known to be a little bit stubborn, but sheep 
were known for their obedience and their gentleness. Shepherds could call their sheep, whether by name or with a short command, or sometimes they would play like a flute or a pipe in a certain order or a certain sound, and, and the sheep would follow. So sheep were so well trained that to follow their shepherd's voice that if another person came and called the sheep, they wouldn't listen. Um, that sheep would be, they just wouldn't follow them. They wouldn't follow that other voice. There's actually even stories of, the, of ancient times where thieves would try to learn the pipe call of the shepherd to try and lure sheep away. They would try to imitate that. There's also stories that if a, um, another family purchased a sheep from a, a different owner, there would be a long and lengthy period of time of retraining the sheep because the sheep was so obedient to the voice of the first shepherd that it would take time for the sheep to actually, like, they would go hungry, they would go without shelter, they would go without safety until they learned that they could trust the new shepherd's voice. So there's a time of even retraining because the sheep were so obedient to the voice of the shepherd. Sheep did not follow unfamiliar voices, and that's what Jesus says as well. Yeah. So you have a good shepherd. Where others will flee in the scene in times of trouble, the good shepherd is there to defend you. When there's a hired help who's unwilling to sacrifice himself for the benefit of the sheep, we have a shepherd who's laid down his life in the face of every enemy. Why? Because you're valuable to him right? Sheep are the shepherd's commodity. It's their livelihood. It's their business, right? Maybe it was their inheritance. It was, they were valuable to the shepherd. That's why he was willing to lay down his life for his sheep, because he knows you and he knows his people. So biblically speaking, when it, we say that someone knows someone else, usually it's a picture of intimacy. It's the same word that gets used for a husband and wife when they know each other, right? Everybody tracking? Do I need to, I don't need to explain further, right? We're all adults in here. We get it? Okay. <laughs> so that's not what Jesus is implying per se here, but he is implying a deep level of intimacy between the shepherd and the sheep, between the father and the son. He knows his sheep and his sheep know him. In uh, verse 7 and 10, Jesus proclaims that he's the door for the sheep. Anybody got little kids or have big kids who once were little? Right? Some of you? Okay. So I have a daughter. She's four. Um, we've been trying to do some sleep training still with her. She doesn't totally sleep through the night and, like, still comes into our room. And, yeah, so we're still working on it, right? Um, we have a sticker chart, the whole deal, to try and get her to, to sleep in her own room and to kind of develop that habit. Um, so breaking the sleep habit has been really hard. When we're having a hard time getting her to go to bed on her own, one surefire way to be able to get her to go to sleep is to sit on the edge of her bed and rub her back gently until she goes to sleep. And then we can get up and we can leave, right? It's, she feels comfort and security knowing that her mom or her dad is there rubbing her back until she falls asleep. Sometimes she, sometimes she wakes up in the middle of the night and she doesn't, she's learned not to cry or wake us up and just like sneaks into our bed and like, I wake up at like six in the morning. She's just kind of on my back and it's like, where did you come from and how, when did you come in here? But there's one night I remember she woke up, she had come into our room, she had laid down, gone to sleep. She woke up while she was in our bed and just started screaming, crying bloody murder. Like anybody like who's been woken up from like a dead sleep at a child, like screaming their head off, you're like, what just happened? Did a cat bite you? Like, did a spider attack you? Like, did dad roll over on you? Like, what <laughs> happened? Why are you screaming like this? I, I'm so disoriented. So she wakes up, and she's just screaming, and she just starts flailing her arms, and I feel her arm on my, um, on my arm, and as soon as she touched me, she just laid back down and went right to sleep. And I was just like, okay. <laughs> I, on the other hand, did not, but she went straight to sleep. Mm -hmm. Very restful. <laughs> but she just needed to know that her mom or dad were there. She needed to know that someone else was there. And then she had the confidence and the peace to go right back to sleep. 
When Jesus says, I am the door, there's some scholarly speculation, so to speak, of the practice of shepherds. So during the summer months, when it was nicer, they would bring the sheep out to pasture, and sometimes they would build a pen out of uh, rocks. They'd build a kind of makeshift pen, but there wouldn't be a gate that they would make. They would just build the rocks around to kind of keep the sheep in. And there's, um, there's some scholarly thoughts out there that say that the shepherd would lay across the opening of the pen as, to act as a door to guard the sheep that he would sleep across the opening as a door, guarding it. So this is my question for you. And these are not rhetorical questions. I really believe that God wants you to wrestle with these. It doesn't have to be just this morning, but wrestling with these questions. Of what would your life look like if you lived as though you were really believing that God guarded your comings and your goings? That Jesus, the door, was laying across that pen Guarding who is coming in and who is coming out and guarding your comings and goings. What would it look like for you to graze in open pastures freely knowing that your shepherd was right there? And not just an act of safety, but what kind of adventures does your shepherd want to call you to? Where's God calling you to? What kind of adventures does your shepherd want to take you on if you know his voice and you can just follow it? How would your anxious thoughts be lulled to rest if you knew that your dad was sitting on the side of your bed rubbing your back, right? What would that be like for you to live with the fullness of belief that that he's right there, that you're safe with your shepherd, that you have access to the pasture to graze freely, and that there's no wolf or enemy that your shepherd hasn't already defeated, Right? What would it look like to live with that kind of confidence? That it's not just a good thought and it's not just a nighttime like, oh, that's peaceful, I'm going to go to sleep. But what would it do to your life, to your actions, to how you lived? So for the sheep, a good shepherd means protection, safety, peace, confidence, certainty. A good shepherd means that you have the green light to rest and that you have the green light to enter pasture. You can have confidence in knowing your shepherd's voice. You can have confidence in knowing your shepherd's voice. So don't let fear rob you from obedience. And don't let doubt be the thief who comes to steal your confidence. You know God's voice and you know the shepherd. That's what Jesus is promising. You know the sheep, or you know the shepherd. You know his voice. You've been trained by God to follow him. You've been trained to only hear the shepherd's voice. It's the voice of peace, it's the voice of love, it's the voice of encouragement, and it's the voice of integrity and character that speaks when you have those moments of doubt of whether you're doing the right thing. It speaks character to you, it speaks confidence to you, it speaks integrity to you. The sheep's job is pretty easy to obey. That's it. That's the sheep's job. The sheep's job is to obey, to trust the voice of the shepherd and to follow. So for the shepherd, he bought you at a high price, right? He bought you at a high price. Sheep were used for two primary main things, right? For a commodity like wool, like so they would shave the sheep and sell the wool, um, which brings wealth and value and increase for the shepherd, or to be used as a sacrifice at the temple, as an offering poured out to God. Okay, so commodity that brings increase in value and prosperity or sacrifice to be poured out at the feet of God. That's what sheep were primarily used for. Now, I don't believe, please take a moment to hear me in context here, I don't believe God sees you as this commodity to be used. That's not what I believe God is doing here. But I do believe, any business people in here, we're a house of, that loves business, right? ROI, return on investment, what is that? Anybody? <laughs> Right? Return on investment. I believe that as our shepherd, he expects a return on his investment. Right? He expects a return on his investment of his sheep. His sheep, if, you're, if sheep were used to bring value and increase to the shepherd, he expects a return on his investment. The sheep know the shepherd's voice for the purpose of obeying it. God speaks not only so we can know him, but so that we can obey his, his calling and his, his, what he's speaking to us. What benefit would it be for the shepherd if he called to his sheep for safety to come into the pen and his sheep just don't listen? What benefit would it be for the sheep, right? 
Like if, he, if, if God is saying, if the shepherd says, hey, snowy, come on in. Like it's getting, it's going to get cloudy. I see the storm starting to swirl. Come on into the safety of the pen. And the sheep stays out there like a stubborn goat. What benefit is it to the shepherd or to the sheep? The shepherd loses, a, loses value if something happens to that sheep. And the sheep loses its life. Right? What good would it be for the sheep and what good would it be for the shepherd? The shepherd has invested into his sheep and there's an expectation that the sheep will listen, obey, and bring increase to the shepherd. Um, I'm actually getting, uh, getting ready to close. This is quick, but I think God was just speaking clearly and precisely through it. And I want to close with this. The main thing that I really felt from the Lord that he wanted to communicate this morning was the notion of divine confidence. That no matter where you find yourself, whether you find yourself in a state of exile or you find yourself in a state of plenty, whether you find yourself warring or in, a, in, in the storm of life or you find yourself at peace, it doesn't really matter where you find yourself. The shepherd knows you and you know him. The shepherd is speaking and he's calling to you and you're, you can hear and obey. You can have the confidence to know your shepherd's voice. You've been trained for it. You've been trained to hear his voice. You've been trained to hear the shepherd's voice and to respond to it. And you've been trained to respond to only his voice, right? If a stranger comes and speaks a different word, you've been trained to not obey it. You can walk in a confident yes to God no matter what he has called you to because your shepherd has your back. I'm going to read uh, one last scripture verse, and I really feel like um, th this is definitely something that you guys have been familiar with, whether you've been in church your whole life or whether you have not been in church very long. This is probably a verse that you have heard before. It's probably very familiar to you. But today and this morning, I'm asking you to listen to it in a totally new light, considering the context we just walked through. Okay, considering what we've just been talking about it, I'd like you to hear it in a new light, to hear it as a declaration and a new promise from your shepherd king. So rather than letting this verse bring pain or suffering, let it bring healing. And rather than letting it mean death, let it mean life. Let it mean victory. Let it mean confidence as you hear it this morning. If you would, just close your eyes and just let it really sink in. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, and he leads me besides the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and you anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you, God. God, I ask that that would be a new declaration of life today. Rather than a, a verse that mean, has mean death and has meant pain, let it bring life and let it bring fullness to our hearts today, God. Let it remind us of the fact that you are our good shepherd, that you lead your sheep in such, in such a peaceful way. You lead your sheep, God, in a way that brings life and brings health and brings pros prosperity to your sheep. God, I ask that it would bring healing to the hearts of those who are suffering, healing to the hearts of those who feel pain, to know that you are the good shepherd who calls to his sheep and that we can have confidence in knowing your voice every day of our lives. And to those, God, who are, are enjoying the sunshine and the green pastures today, God, that they too would just hear the shepherd's call to go out further, to go on an adventure, to check out that new creek or that new river that you're leading them to, God, that there's a new adventure waiting for them no matter where they're at. Why? Because you're a good shepherd, because you make us lay down in green pastures, because you restore our, our soul. 
because you're our good shepherd. Because when the wolves come to attack, God, your rod and your staff, they comfort me because they're a sign of protection. Because when my enemies come to destroy me, you prepare a table as I feast before them. Because I have no fear, because my cup runs over. Surely your goodness, God, it's been a theme all this morning, your goodness, God, and your mercies, God, shall follow me all the days of my life, and confidently I dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you, God. God, I, I pray that that would just enhance us, that that would just increase our faith in you, and God, that ultimately it would give us the confidence to walk in a new day, in a new life, in a new season, and the confidence to simply just say yes, that as sheep, God, you've called us to just hear your voice and obey. It's really that simple. You've called us to hear your voice and to obey and to say yes to our shepherd forever, every day. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thanks, God. Yeah. God, I just thank you for your goodness, and I thank you for this week, Lord, and I thank you for the adventures that you're just leading us on. Amen. Amen. Amen.